Test one, two, we on? All right. Always a joy to welcome you this morning. It's great to see everyone here and those that are joining on live. Uh, one of the, the joys of being a pastor is each Saturday or Sunday, people report in the, that they either will or won't be here and that they'll be watching online. So there's many names we could call out, uh, but we're grateful for those who uh, every bit a part of our fellowship and our family, but they, they just can't be here for various reasons, uh, all good. So uh, we miss you guys, we love you, and look forward to seeing you very soon. This morning, um, one quick announcement, next week we will be voting on the deacons, and you receive something by uh, email and uh, digitally about that. If you have any questions, you can see me afterwards. Uh, that'll be next week. And so is Carolyn here? We'll go ahead and let the kids... We'll go ahead and empty the building here. For our call to worship this morning, Philip. Uh, Thompson's going to come and share some scripture and pray with us as we begin our time of worship. Good morning. Not sure we move, move the mic over here. Maybe that was too far to walk over there. Proverbs 18:15 says, "A prudent man, the mind of a prudent man, acquires knowledge." Of course, prudent is simply acting with or showing care for thought or future, thought of the future. Well, this morning, to start off our worship, I want to read some of Psalm 89. Psalm 89, verse 1 and verse 15 are like stanzas. And 2 to 14, that's the chorus. And then verses 16 through to 18, they're basically a celebration of life or an understanding or a declaration of life. Verse 1 stanza says, I will sing the loving kindness of the Lord forever. Verse 15, how blessed are the people who know that joyful sound. I will sing the loving kindness of the Lord forever. To all generations I will make known thy faithfulness with my mouth. For you have said, and more than one person is speaking here, for you have said, loving kindness will be built up forever. In the heavens, I will establish thy faithfulness. I have made covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David, my servant, that I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations or before all generations. The heavens will praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the sky is comparable to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord? A God greatly feared in the counsel of the holy ones. An awesome above all those who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is like thee, O mighty Lord? Thy faithfulness also surrounds thee. Thou dost rule the swelling sea. When its waves rise, thou dost still them. Thou thyself did crush Egypt like one who was slain. Thou did scatter thine enemies with thine mighty arm. The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine, and the world and all it contains. Thou hast founded them, the north and the south. Thou created them. Tabor and Hermon shout for joy at thy name. Thou hast a strong arm. Thy hand is mighty. Thy right hand is exalted. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of thy throne. Loving kindness and truth go before thee. How blessed are the people that know that joyful sound. Because, O Lord, they walk in the light of thy countenance, and in thy name they rejoice all the day. By thy righteousness they are exalted, for thou art glory of their strength. And by thy favor our horn is exalted. For our shield, which is faith, Ephesians 6, belongs to the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful morning you've given us. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that we can lift you up, 
that we can praise you, that we can draw near to you. Father, your words will be spoken today. May they not just rest on our hearts, but Lord, would they dig deep? Would they break us? Would they build us up? Would they discipline us? God, we thank you so much for who you are and your love for us in this generation. And Father, I pray, Lord, that we seek your face daily. Bless us this morning. Bless the instrumentation. Bless the music, Lord. May it glorify you, and may we glorify you with our hearts, our thoughts, and our minds. Amen. So we enter a time of worship. Let's stand and sing. We're only here for one thing, and that's to worship our God, Lord and Creator, Savior of our soul. focused 
Uh, keep us alert and ready and eager to hear what you'd have to say to us through your word. And may your spirit move, convict hearts, and change lives. Open our eyes to the things that you want us to see. It's in Christ's awesome and holy name we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. Time to get down there yet, but we're getting closer, I guess. Now, right now, people on Facebook are hearing my voice, and they're in the kitchen getting together a bagel or a donut or something, kind of listening to the worship, waiting for, for, for the preaching to start. So now they have to run back in there with their coffee and orange juice and, uh, and have a seat. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to Colossians. No, no, we are through with Colossians, but I've said that for so long, it just feels natural, it feels right, it feels, it feels good. God, God has given us the book of Colossians, and we know it better, but he's also, he's given us 65 others. There's 66 books that God has given us, and they comprise what we call the, the Holy Scriptures, the, the Word of God. And, I, and, I, and, and they're very diverse, and I hope everyone here, you know, clearly knows and understands, not all the nuances, but, but Genesis is, is, very, is, is very different. It's not like Exodus. And Exodus is not like Leviticus. And Leviticus is not like Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is not like Numbers. You know, we, we, we've all tried to, you know, read devotionally through Numbers and, and maybe struggled. You know, many... And I may stretch a little bit here to say, if not most in the church today, they struggle to read God's Word every day. And they have a choice of 66 books to read from for either devotion or, or study. But God, see, in His, in His infinite goodness, His, 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 His goodness is, is infinite, it's without measure, and, and, his, and for his own glory, he's spoken to us through the scriptures. And so, out of his goodness, he's given us narrative literature. He's, he's giving us stories. We can find poetry. We can find prophecy. And we can even see some of the apocalyptic literature about the things to come. But he's also given us this, this thing called parables. And, and parables are simple. Well, it's kind of simple. We know what they are when we read them. But if we're going to define them, it's going to be really difficult. But that's what we're going to focus on this morning. And over the next several weeks, we're going to focus on these teachings of Jesus that we call parables. There's nothing childish about them. So let's get a little bit of context here and look at several. This will just be an introduction introductory lesson okay so let's look at a few scriptures that'll kind of frame this the first is john 1 17 for the law that's the decalogue the law was given through moses we find that in exodus but grace and truth goodness and truth it came through jesus christ through the life that he lived and the word that we have that um that we would call our, our, our New Testament, especially the Gospels. John 1, 17. Matthew 7, 29. For he taught them as one having authority and not like the scribes. The scribes and the Pharisees were the religious Jewish leaders, and they were the ones that were all studied up, and they could read, and they knew everything. And so he didn't teach like those know-it-alls. He taught like someone else. I didn't say this is not my original quote. Jesus was the, is, was the master of all teachers, right? But he's also the teacher of all masters. Now, you have to write that down and hang, let that hang with you. He was the master of all teachers, but he was the teacher of all masters. If anybody stood, and that's what the Pharisees used to do, they would sit and they would quote other, other Pharisees, but they wouldn't come back and say, thus saith the Lord. Matthew twenty two sixteen, And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians. 
And what did it saying? What? Teacher, they were requesting, teacher, we know that you're true and you teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone for you do not regard the person of men. It shows you something very unique about the character and the person of Jesus and it was easily recognizable. Next scripture, Matthew, John 8, 28. Jesus says to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, that's when he's crucified, then you will know that I am he, he being the Messiah, and that I do nothing by myself, don't do anything by myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. John seven forty six. The officers... The officer says, when, when they presented Jesus towards this tr- uh, before this tribunal to say, how did this, this man get healed? We need to know the story about how this man got healed. These eyewitnesses who are the officer says this, no man ever spoke like this man. They didn't say what he did. They didn't say how he did it. They just said this, this guy's got a character. This is a person. There's no man that's like him. That's exactly right. He's the God man. John 21, 23, 25, that's exactly right. This is the last um, uh, scripture, last verse in the Gospel of John. And so to summarize all that we've studied in the book of John, the writer says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did besides what we've read in the New Testament, which if they were written just one by one, I suppose even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Jesus is, is going to give us uh, parables. What a glorious way to teach. Uh, Matthew 13, 3, 13, 3 so he, he didn't have it. He spoke many things to them in parables. That's what the scriptures, there it is. And he spoke many things to them in parables. In parables. He spoke so many things in parables that they had to say this. It was so many, however many there were. This was a characteristic. It wasn't just a, I got a great idea, I'm going to tell you a story. A third of the recorded, the recorded teachings of Jesus is found to be in parables. I can't recall exactly which gospel it is. But there's 38 parables and 36 miracles. There's more parables than miracles. And we all think, well, gosh, Jesus did so many miracles. And probably of of all the things that you right now remember about Jesus, if I were to give you a little quiz, you would tell me something. You would know those answers that come from the parables than the other scriptures. So let's, let's, get some, let's, let's, let's continue to lay this foundation about parables because we're going to look at it uh, from various uh, vantage points in the, in the coming weeks. These parables were ingeniously simple words. They were simple word pictures that had a very profound spiritual lesson. He would say something about something in everyday life, and then suddenly it was like, all right, here you go. Wow. We, that we begin to see something that's, that's very deep and true spiritually. They were everyday stories. And they were everyday stories that everyone relates to. There was nobody who would sit back and say, what's he talking about? Regardless of what re- region he was teaching in. Now, they didn't understand many of the truths because they were deep and they were hidden. But they understood the story, and that's what piqued their interest about what's the truth that Jesus... And why is he doing it this way? And he's doing it this way because we'll never forget. And and I'm going to show that to you here in just a moment. Jesus' parables captivated his, his hearers. And it sustained their interest... It wasn't like, okay, I heard what you said, and then turn and walk away. I heard what he said, but I can't get away from what he said. And so it would stay. And look, it has already 2,000 years later. We still go to the parables. That's right. We still go back to the parables. Man, I've read that, and I've known it, and it's simple, but I still, I'm still learning things from it. 
Jesus was the master storyteller. And it wasn't because he was talented. It wasn't because of his voice, however it sounded. All right, he, he, was, he is the master of all things. Storytelling was one of them. Uh, I think it was John MacArthur or somebody uh, in some of my research, they said this, there's, there's not a truism that's so familiar or a doctrine that's so complex that he, that's Jesus, could not give it new depth and insight through the telling of a simple story. It was almost like, well, why didn't you say it that way in the first place? Why didn't he, why didn't he just always tell stories? Hope I don't have to answer that. So this morning, and in our future study of the parables, I trust that we'll begin to go back to something that is also familiar to us, these stories, these texts, and we'll listen, and we'll learn, and we'll apply these in our, in our lives and allow them to not only challenge us, but to, to transform us. So let's start with a couple of quick questions, and then we, and then we miraculously, then we close. What is a parable? A parable is a story. It's a story that places two things side by side, not so much for comparison, but for teaching. Let me say that again. We want to think, well, an apple is like an orange in that they're both fruits, no, it's not like that. It's a story that whereby Jesus would put common everyday things besides something else in order to teach about the one thing that you didn't know that much about. This genius method of teaching placed something that was well known next to something that was unknown. All right? And so... Jesus' parables of the New Testament were, were easily identified by us because they, they always contained the word like. When we read some of these stories and, and this is like that, then we know that we've encountered a parable. It's an earthly story that opens up a, a portal for heavenly learning. To learn something about the goodness of God, the glory of God, the greatness of God. Just the character and the person of God the Father. So, audience participation time. How many parables do you think there are in all of Scripture? A lot, okay. Well, so far he's closer than anybody else. A lot plus one or a lot minus one? And then you get... Huh? How about 250? There's 250 parables in the entire Bible. In the Gospels, there's 45 total. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. There's 15 in Matthew, uh, 12 in Mark, 17 in Luke. And in John, there's, there's only one. If you add those up and they're not 45, you need to be friends with Bill Horner. Inside joke, you'll get it later. Parables are true to life. Here's the thing. They're true to life. They're not like Aesop's fables and stories we tell the grandkids. Once upon a time, there was. There, there's no none of this once upon a time. They're not fables. They weren't made up. They were real. And when he, when he spoke of these things, people immediately identified with that. They're true to life. They were for adults. They weren't for children. They were easy to remember and that's why Jesus used them, because he didn't say, how many of you brought your scriptures this morning? He can say that to the multitudes that were there. They didn't have the scriptures. So what he told them, due to oral tradition, they had to go back and be, you know, yeah, we heard Jesus. He was talking about this guy who, this, this seed man who went out and cast seed out. Yeah, okay. And, and so then they would tell these stories literally word for word. They were easy to remember. Right. None of you studied for the lesson for the sermon this morning, okay? But, but to show you how easily these things are, and this is one of the hardest of the parables, there were, in, in, in one of Jesus' parables, he talks about three lost things. What are the three things that are lost? A coin, what else? A son, and what else? A sheep, that's right. 
Now, see, you didn't even, you didn't even study that, and everybody said, I knew that. I should have spoke up. I want to impress the preacher. I, I, I knew that. And you know that because, well, you've heard it a thousand times before. And it's one of Jesus' parables. And you know far more than that. You, you know how many soils that they were sowed on. The power comes from the fact that when you hear the parables, you recognize this. Well, that's right. That's the way it is in life. He never, he never told a parable and said something. What world's he living in? He must be from Palestine or something. You know, he's, he's not from around here. Nobody talks like that. Nobody uses that. They were, everybody was familiar with it. And they would say, that's the way it is in real life. I've said this various times before. Things aren't true because they're in the Bible. They're in the Bible because they're true. Right, people encountered things about God. And they said, you know what? Not only, uh, this needs to be written down. And so, just because it comes out of this book doesn't mean it's true. It's in there because people found, man, that's where life is. That's where we can learn and grow. And so, that's what a, a parable is. And so, we're going to be comparing these things uh, in the weeks to come. Maybe not so much next week as the week following. So, what is the purpose of the parables? If we know what they are, what was the purpose of them? Well, it wasn't just whatever. Something good might come out of this. So, so to get an idea, let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Hope some of you may have even already turned there, knowing that this is what we're going to find. We're going to read verses 10 through 17. This is the word of the Lord. Let me read from mine here. And this is uh, entitled in my scriptures, it says, The Purpose of the Parables. And the disciples, they came to Jesus and they said, Why do you speak to them in parables? Now, I've got to stop right there. This is, you know, if they heard the parables, why did they say, Why do you speak to them in parables? Why, why do you speak to us in parables? Why, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answers and he says to them, because it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it has not been given. So he, he clarifies and straightens the message, well, to you this and for them that. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And he will have in abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has, is going to be taken away from him. Therefore, therefore, because of what he said, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they don't hear, nor do they understand. Heart issue. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, he's going to go back to the Old Testament and quote from the prophet Isaiah. Hearing you will hear. And you shall not understand. And seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. And their ears, they're hard of hearing. And their eyes have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And understand with their hearts. And turn so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see. And your eyes for they hear. For assuredly, verily, verily, I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and they didn't see it. And to hear what you hear, and they did not hear it. That's a really long discourse. I mean, he showed great patience, clarity, as he answered in the right now and the not yet, the purpose of the parables. And don't you know they walked away understanding some, but not most. But not most. So, he began speaking in parables because of the hardness of people's hearts. Why didn't he just, really, why didn't he just overlook the hardness of their hearts? Why didn't he just show them patience and grace and, and maybe the, the, their hearts would soften a little bit? So, there's two purposes of the parables. 
One is to conceal, and the other is to reveal. And it says it right there in the text. Do you see it? The conceal. For, for whoever... Um, I speak therefore to them in parables because seeing they don't see and hearing they don't hear, nor do they understand. I'm speaking in parables in order to conceal it because these people are never going to get it. We're going to see a little bit why they're not going to get it because, well, their eyes are closed. They're not physically blind, but they might as well be. They weren't physically deaf, but they, they might as well be. They weren't hearing. They were seeing and hearing, and their hearts were dull. They were hard as stone. They had hard hearts. And so from those people, what the, when Jesus made these comparisons, the truth, the truth was concealed. They were a part of the crowd, but that's about all that they were a part of. They were curious and maybe nothing, maybe nothing more. Because see, really, they were around in order to uh, have their needs met, you know, get some food. Uh, I like the feeding of the 5,000 or to, to see or to receive a miracle. So to some who were apathetic and, and ignorant, they, they, it was concealed. And so he used parables to do that. The second reason that he used them was in, in, in order to reveal and to teach them. Remember, it's all about teaching. He used them to teach things about the kingdom of heaven. And we see that in verse 11. Because it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. That's why I'm going to tell you these parables. Things yet unknown are going to be made known. And you're going to be some of the first people to grasp this and hear this. Get ready. See, there were, there were in every crowd those who hungered and thirsted for truth. For truth. Their hearts were soft. Their, their hearts were open. Their hearts were touchable. It says that they are repentant. So we read in the latter part of, of, of uh, Matthew 13. They were repentant. They understood. They wanted to understand what these comparisons meant. And so they, they were like the disciples. They asked. They asked questions. And so we'll see that as we look at some of those parables later on. Um, a few weeks ago I was preaching and uh, I used a word. And I didn't tell anybody what the word meant. And so I said, if you go home and you look it up, just send me a little note and let me know what was there. It was a way to arouse interest. I was shocked at how few people, it wasn't nobody, but I was shocked at how few people actually said something about, hey, I looked that word up and, and this. Or I couldn't find the word. Or, or somehow there was, but it was amazing how shallow the engagement was. Something that you could learn new that really, that really, um, was applicable in the message, and yet it seemed, at least pastorally, that very few could care. I got something. You made me, don't make me work. Don't make me go, go home and have to Google something or uh, look, you know, look something up. Now, we're going to close, this, close out our message this morning from Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to look at verse 34 through 36. The, the, the parables were to conceal and to reveal. 1334. All these things that Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable, he didn't speak to them. Leave it right there, see? This is not just a strategy. This is an intentional plan that's going to bear it's going to bear fruit. And so he when he spoke to multitudes, he was always going to use this parable in order to reveal to some and conceal to others. Verse 35. 
that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying in obedience to the what we find in the old testament i will open my mouth in parables and i will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world verse 36 he gets into a, a new parable then jesus sent the multitudes away and went into the house and his disciples came to him saying this would you please explain to us the parables of the tares of the field? First thing they they heard a parable, and they just said, "Man, I can't wait till I get him behind closed doors." Said, Man, I got to ask about this. What's this and that, and how does this apply? And so, his question is: Here's what it was. It was discipleship time. It was discipleship time. Let's take this everything that everyday thing that happens in our life and first show us how we missed it. Why, why don't we see this of ourselves? Why can't we know this? And so there's things that have to be taught and caught. So they ask, geez, what does this mean? Not so that we can go out and tell everybody, I know what that means. That's not it. It was to teach. You see, the kingdom of heaven was a mystery to people. And, and to be honest, it's a mystery to most in the church today. Because of topical preaching, or, or so they, we don't just get out and study, this is what a parable is, and this is why Jesus used, and these are the parables that he told, and when he said that, this is what we're going to, this is what we're going to, how we're going to grow from that. The kingdom of heaven was a mystery. The kingdom of heaven was hidden because of the hardness of people's hearts. But they did, they did shed light and place um, emphasis on God's divine judgment. Right now, the kingdom of God is working. It's at work quietly. And strangely, as we're going to learn, it's at work secretly among people. The kingdom of God pushes no one in. It's not a siren call either. But it's something, the kingdom is something that has to be willingly received. And if you want a little teaser for the next week and the weeks to come, it has to do with transcendence. It has to do with transcendence. So let me ask, as, as a way of, of just preparation, how are, how are we, as the body of Christ, as, the, as First Baptists, how are we receiving and studying and reading and handling the Word of God, in particular the parables as we deal with them in our time in the scriptures before the lord do do we allow the the, the spirit of god to to illustrate and to clarify these transforming truths about this about who jesus is do, do, we, do we allow to do that about the gospel and the clear understanding, not only the gospel that saves us, but the daily gospel that sanctifies us and transforms us? Or the, the kingdom of heaven? And that's what we'll look at next week. W what is this kingdom of heaven if that's what all the parables point towards? Oh, this is a story about that, and that's a story about this. No, they're, they're all about the kingdom of heaven. And so there are more than stories to consider, and there's certainly more than just puzzles that we're going to try to solve. Philip's reading, he had no real idea what I was going to say. He had no copy of my transcript. But here's the sobering part, and I said to Cheryl, you know, I'm really excited about the message. It's, it's, it's really going to draw people in a point right up to the end. And here's the hard part. They declare divine judgment. That's what they do. In a simple, clear, this is like this, it's going it's gonna, to it's gonna create divine judgment. It's going to reveal to some here and some there, you're in, you're out. You're in the kingdom, you're not in the kingdom. It's, 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 it's going to be a, a divine judgment against unbelief, against apathy, of just not caring, of, of unrighteousness and ignorance. Divine judgment. 
See, apathy is to know and to not care. All right? If somebody's apathetic, well, they know the truth. They just don't, don't care. They're not, it's not going to do anything about it. But, you know, there's others that are in ignorance. They don't know. And so they don't know that they don't care. They, they, just out of their ignorance, they're under divine judgment. And so we're going to see and learn that these parables were given to us to arouse us and, and get, our, get our focus away from and off of, as we preach to it all through Colossians and, and the Gospels, there's two kingdoms that we're always living in. This little kingdom of ourselves. And we're just, we've got, we're enthroned and we're trying to make our kingdom work. And then there's the kingdom of God's dear son. And so we, we want to live in a foot in that one and a foot in this one. But we can't do that. And so gloriously through the parables, Jesus is, is going to show us what this, what this kingdom of heaven is. And, and, and give us an, an invitation. But more than that, he's going to drop a rescue line. A draw a rescue line. He's going to bridge that by giving us an invitation. If you're tired of living in that little kingdom of your own, there's another kingdom. And I'm inviting you to it. And I paid the price for your passage and your pardon. It's about his kingdom. After all, Jesus tells us again and again and again, that's what we're creating. We were created for God's kingdom, but we keep trying to make it work in ours. And then we invite God into ours. Come over here, God. Is it over here and help me here. Why? When I have this over here. Matthew 6.33. Anybody know Matthew 6.33? Anybody spit it off? All right. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Boy, that's a promise. We all know that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. There's one word missing. What is it? One word missing. Huh? Anybody looked it up? But. But. Seek ye first. The kingdom of God. Does that make much difference? Absolutely. Absolutely. How can something so simple, so little change that? Well, that's where we're headed, folks. I trust that you'll start to pick up the scriptures, and I'll try to maybe let you a little bit know a little bit ahead of time which parable we'll be focusing on as we do that. But this morning, as we close out with several songs of worship, we flip the order this morning, not to try something new, uh, but it'll, 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 we'll run like this for a while. It'll give us more time to consider and ponder what it is that the Spirit has said and taught this morning and that we find in truth of the worship. So uh, let's close in prayer, and Philip and the worship team will come and close us out. Father, it's easy to say thank you for your parables, I mean for your word, and, and just overlook things like the parables and so we're with anticipation, with eagerness, and even with excitement that comes uh, not in the flesh, but by way of your Holy Spirit. Uh, we're excited to begin to learn more about this kingdom of God. We know how things are going in our kingdom, and, and they're not real good right now. They're not great right now. We kind of feel out of control in our kingdom right now. We're kind of powerless to do some things in our kingdom right now. And so we're not just going to experiment. We're not just going to consider. Lord, we're going we're gonna to discern. And, and we're going to act upon the invitation to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. Trusting you to add what we cannot add with our own hands and our own effort. And so that's our desire, that's our plea, that's our prayer that we offer in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. As we enjoy a time of worship and response, let's stand and sing. Uh, do the things that we'll learn uh, over the next few weeks.
Uh, we will learn nothing, we'll know nothing more if it's not for the Spirit moving and opening up our eyes and ears. So it's Him, it's in Christ alone, it's in Him we put our trust. He's our foundation for what we're going to learn. So let's praise Him. Play for all to see. You are light, you are light. When the darkness closes in, you are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sin. Amen. And you are peace, you are peace. When my fear is crippled.
song. Uh, it's one of my favorite old hymns. Uh, it stands the test of time because it speaks of truth uh, that we need in, in any time, whether in darkness or in, uh, in the light, in, on the hilltop or in the valley. Uh, Christ has saved us, and through those times we can say it is well with our soul, even uh, in times like a pandemic or uh, the loss of a loved one or a uh, a diagnosis, or letting Katie drive us side by side. Uh, in all things, we can say it as well, not from our own power, our own strength, or our own anything that we can muster up, but it's in Christ alone uh, that we can say those things. So when peace like
praise. He is worthy. He is worthy. All right. Uh, have a seat just a moment, please. Uh, the Lord didn't give me a, a benediction. I thought, well, okay, we'll, we'll see what he has planned. He had something else in store. And so as we were singing, uh, Ernie and Al- Angela came forward, and they said, um, we'd, we'd like to join the church this morning. And so um, we don't... We don't you know, we don't do an advertisement for that. If, if God's got a place that he wants people to be, they'll know that and they'll reveal it to us rather than us trying to reel somebody in or do something like that. And, and there are others who are in the process of, of becoming members of the church. You don't have to jump through hoops or anything else. You just have to let us know that. And then we'll do what we, uh, we'll do the preparation. We'll teach a little class and, and then we'll, but this morning I'm going to ask Ernie and Angela to come forward if y'all would. And I'm grateful that they just came up and finally just said, Bill, what's something we need to do? You think, well, it's social distancing. You can't come up here and love and hug on them, but you can come by and, and, and express to them um, gratitude for their presence. They're here every, just every Sunday over here. Um, two grandkids, uh, Zach and uh, Jackson and Angela as well. And so uh, when... Yeah, here he, here's my man. There you go. So part of what the class teaches is this. We become a a member of a church. You know, we shouldn't be an orphan. Everyone that's seriously walking with the Lord and and in discipleship, you know, they need to be a part of a church. They need to be part of a family. Uh, There there shouldn't be any orphans. And so they come, and and in coming, uh, it's not just to come and worship, but they're coming in order to state by their presence here that they're willing to give their time, their talents, and their gifts um, in the service of our church, our community, and the Lord. And so um, we, have, we have a responsibility in return to love them and encourage them um, and to walk with them as we walk together. That's the, the work, the walk, and the, the witness and worship. So we're grateful for your... Um, response to the Lord that says whoever so will come and so and so we receive them uh, by faith we'll also present them later with some others after they've gone through our new members class Uh, but if you rejoice in their decision to become a part of our body and family even though they sit there every Sunday um, would you say amen amen Amen. all right make sure you come by and, and at least from a distance, greet them, let them know where, I tell you what, maybe we'll do that outside. And they can just do it as they walk outside. It'll be a little bit easier. So if you stand, I'll close this in prayer. Father, it's mornings like this that we, uh, it's worship like this where we see you're always at work. Uh, through a hymn, through a stanza, through a scripture, through a sermon, through an example of someone uh, like the Fords coming wanting to do more than than sit and listen and sing but to, to serve and to give and to go and so for others who are in that process oh god i pray that you would give them peace and discernment and that they too would step out and even during these strange times become a part of a body um, that's growing just like your kingdom so lord with gratitude and thanksgiving we thank you and we praise you for all that you have done this morning and even more that you're gonna do because you're god and it's all for your glory that we pray this prayer in jesus name amen god bless you